coming up on the Purposeful Podcast. There's a, a word that's starting to creep back into the lexicon uh, that that hasn't reared its ugly head in a while, but things are certainly starting to look that way, and that's stagflation. And what stagflation is, is when you have high rates of inflation and either extremely low or negative economic growth. And we were just recently uh, mentioning that the rate of inflation is accelerating. Well, the, the information that seems to be coming out about the US economy is indicating that growth is decelerating. You're listening to The Purposeful Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Purposeful Podcast. I'm Matt. I'm Psyche. We're super excited to have you with us this week. So we have a great episode on uh, on deck for you. But before we get into any of that, I'd like to please ask you, if you like what we're doing, if you like our content, please subscribe. You can hear our podcasts on your favorite podcast directory or you can watch the podcasts on YouTube and Rumble. So if you like what you hear, if you're interested in learning more about what we do and finding more content, please tune into those places and subscribe to our feeds and that'll automatically populate that for you. So we'd love to have you as a regular member of our, our community. And you can also check us out on Facebook, look us up at Convergent Digital Media. So this week, uh, we're going to kind of get into our first segment, which is giving back. So this is something that we started recently uh, doing on a regular basis. And, you know, part of what we believe here at the Purposeful Podcast is that what we do should be uh, meaningful, it should be purposeful, and, and part of living a meaningful life is giving back. You know, that's that's what our legacy is going to be in the end is is not how much stuff we have, but how much we uh, we used what we had to enrich others and to uh, enrich the relationships that we have. So this week, the story that I'd like to feature is uh, from the Kubota Tractor Company. So Kubota is in their 50th year uh, here in the States and uh, at least that's the way I understand it. Um, they have a program called the Kubota Community Choice Award. So annually, uh, they take applications and they give a $100,000 grant to a municipality or a county or uh, something like that for a, a, a project, some sort of revitalization project, something to refresh a local community or whatnot. Well, because it's their 50th year, this year they're doing five of those. So they're gonna do five $100,000 grants, uh, one in each of the company's operating regions. And then uh, come July, after these uh, projects have been awarded, they're gonna have a vote, a public vote, and uh, they're going to be eligible. These five grant winners are going to be eligible potentially to win an additional hundred thousand dollar grant. So that's very exciting. And uh, you know, Kubota being a tractor company, uh, they're they're very much an agrarian oriented type type company. And you know, a lot of these smaller farming type communities, uh, they really do need some revitalization. And this is a great program to help people do that. You know, a little bit can go a long way in a small town. So I'm very excited to see how that goes. If you happen to be someone who's interested in applying for one of those grants, uh, you can actually do that uh, online at KubotaHometownProud.com. And they are accepting applications through April 15th. 2022. So if you happen to be someone who uh, is interested in applying or you know someone who should uh, get the news out, I'm excited to see where this goes. But, you know, it just goes to show you that uh, there are a lot of folks doing a lot of good in the world. And 
you know, if you listen to the news or you read the news on a regular basis, you probably get drowned in negativity, right? I mean, bad news makes the, the big headlines, but do a little digging. You know, we always encourage you to find the good. There's a lot of it out there and um, it's, it's definitely worth highlighting. So kudos this week to the Kubota Tractor Company for giving back. Uh, the, the rest of this episode, we are going to uh, do our, our usual. We're going to get into some current event. Uh, today was a big day. The inflation numbers came out. So we're going to talk about where that stands. That seems to be a recurring theme on our, on our <laughs> weekly program. Uh, and, and we're going to look at where the economy is headed as well. I, I think that we're starting to finally see the impact of these, these prices on uh, consumer spending. So we're going to get into that a little bit. And then we also talked about uh, the electric car question. You know, there, there are a lot of folks out there, especially from our current presidential administration saying, you know, hey, this is a good time to think about buying an EV. Uh, so we're going to we're going to look into that. We're going to see a little bit about, you know, does it make sense? Is it a good choice? Uh, what are maybe some alternative choices to consider? And then finally, we're going to do our savings hack of the week. Uh, but before we get into that, man, let's take a second. How are you doing this week? I'm doing fantastic, brother. Better than I deserve. How about yourself? And me too. I've been able to, to do a little traveling. I was in San Antonio last week for uh, business. I'm in Orlando this week for business, as you can tell from my hotel room, echoey hotel room and, and beautiful background here. But uh, it's good. It's a good time of year. I'm excited. Spring is springing. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's the weather's the weather's getting warmer, at least down here in Florida <laughs> and, uh, and I'll take it. So it's all good. Well, with that, we're gonna kick this out to our intro. You're listening to The Purposeful Podcast with Matt Viebig and Psyche Filios. All right, brother. So we're going to kick this off with our current events and the first and uh, possibly the most important for your pocketbook is that uh, the inflation report came out and uh, February's CPI consumer price index came in at a 7.9% annualized rate. So uh, what that means, if you look at the trends, is not just that inflation is remaining high, but that it's actually accelerating from one month to the next. The rate of inflation is going higher and higher and higher. And obviously with the world events uh, that are going on right now, that could continue to be the case. So when you saw that, what were your initial thoughts when you saw that report? Well, I wasn't surprised and it, it it is a little bit higher than I expected it to be, but I wasn't surprised that it was still that it, it's still climbing. Uh, all you have to do is go to the grocery store or go to try to buy anything and, and you're going to see that prices have gone up. I suspect March will be the same thing. It's going to be high again. Um, and it's too early to tell for after that. But even with all the current events going on, March has it's already here and you see what's happening. So. Um, and everybody I talk to here in our, in our local area, at least, or any vendors I deal with, they're still talking about raising prices. So as, as prices uh, raise, there goes inflation. Yeah. Well, one of the big factors contributing to that right now is the price of oil and subsequently yeah. the price of gasoline. I can tell you, I, I went to Texas for six days, and in those six days, uh, the the gas station that I use at home, uh, the price went up 54 cents a gallon in six days. I mean, that's just enough to make you want to gag. It, yes. it was kind of painful. 
Yeah, I think we're at record levels, aren't we? I mean, nationally as the average, we're over $4 at this point. Yeah, and it, it depends on how you look at it. Um, I think the the actual gross prices are at all time records. I think the average hit 424 a gallon or something yeah. like that um, in the last day or two. If you look at the inflation adjusted numbers and go back to the previous highs in 2008, I don't think we're quite there yet. We're well on our way and the way those prices are going up, uh, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility that we're going to hit inflation adjusted all time highs pretty soon. And uh, obviously, you've got the, the war going on between Russia and Ukraine that is continuing to uh, grab the headlines. I know this week the United States uh, decided that they were going to go ahead and boycott Russian oil altogether. Um, I've seen some stories that the Biden administration was reaching out to uh, some other countries like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and uh, some of those folks weren't even answering the phone. So that's <laughs> not a good sign. Surprise. Um, <laughs> you know, it, there, there are definitely foreign policy ramifications and national security ramifications from all that. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking more at the financial side of things, but there, there's a lot going on in terms of boycotts. Uh, of Russia, I think most of the major financial players in terms of banking and transactions uh, either have already put some sort of a moratorium on doing business in Russia or with Russia into effect. If they haven't, they are probably planning to do so. Uh, that's That's putting significant pressure and significant pain on the Russian economy. And eventually, you know, without financing, they may not have as easy a time getting the oil that they have out of the ground anyway. But even if there's not a significant reduction in output, the market is certainly pricing all of this uncertainty into um, the, the oil prices, which I think I said last episode that they might get as high as 120 dollars a barrel according to one expert and i think that they flew past that pretty quickly <laughs> yeah so i was actually just going to look it up here real quick to see what today's numbers were um and i'll check that out here in a second as you speak i'll, I'll get it pulled up yeah well as you do that um i'm gonna look at the the inflation report in a little more detail something that, that we've talked about multiple times is that not everything that is inflating is inflating at the same rate. The 7.9% year over year is an average uh, that is calculated. Uh, the, the consumer price index is basically looking at a basket of goods and what did that basket cost a year ago versus what does that basket cost today? It's not a comprehensive number. And, you know, there, there's another index that looks at what they call core prices. And core prices exclude things like energy and uh, food. Well, you know, obviously the big three that people spend their money on are housing, transportation, and groceries. So in those particular areas, inflation has been exceedingly high. So as we commented on last week, depending on what your income level is, uh, you may be feeling the effects of inflation much more severely than, than maybe some other folks are. And the worrisome thing for me is when you see the rate of inflation continuing to accelerate you know, it begs the question, when is it going to stop? And it begs the question, what is it going to take to turn this around? And I think, you know, the, the answer to the first question is that there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Uh, before we dig in, though, let me, let me kick it back to you. What did you find about the price of oil? 
Well, from what I see, it's dipped yesterday and today, and somehow it's around 106 is where it's settled at, it looks like. All right. Uh, that'll be temporary, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's volatile for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. and one thing that we've talked about in the past is to be aware of volatile markets. Um, I, I imagine when you're the, the gas station operator, you're not going to lower your prices by 30%, even if the cost of a barrel of oil declines by 30%, because tomorrow it might be right back up. So a lot of times when, when there's fear, those prices go up in a hurry, and then they kind of sustain until the, the volatility in the market tones down some. Because if you expect that there's a reasonable chance that prices are going to be really high tomorrow, even if you're not sure, you know, you're not going to slash the prices today. So, you know, it's funny how that always works. I know my wife and I always complain, you know, the cost of gas goes up really fast, but it yeah. always seems to come down really, really yeah. slowly. <laughs> <laughs> it takes the elevator up and the stairs down. Man, you ain't kidding. <laughs> so it seems. Well, uh, so let's get back to those questions. Um, how long? You know, I mean, there's been a lot of talk that this was going to be transitory. Um, I think that the definition of transitory has probably changed from something like six to 12 months to hopefully not more than a few years. But uh, what's your read on that? You know, it's, it's a hard read. Right. So I think it's, I think we're going to have inflation here for the foreseeable future. Obviously, at some point, it has to level out. Um, but really, what that means is, as, as a consumer, as a family, we're just going to have to get accustomed to spending more money for products. And in a time like this, the best way to shield yourself is. You have to make sure you have your emergency savings in place and you have enough of a cushion set aside because you just don't know, especially if you have people dependent on you. You have children and you have a wife, you have family at home. Um, when, when they say they're going to release reserves from somebody else. So just, just with the oil issue specifically, yes, you can stop bringing in oil from Russia and it might only be, I think 3%, believe it or not, I think is what they said we, we imported from Russia. Well, right. you can't just turn on the faucet and get that 3% by tomorrow. Uh, it, it's not going to take six months, but uh, I expect it to take 30 to 60 days to keep that market volatility moving up and down a lot. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's reasonable. Um, there's just so much that's going into inflation right now that it's it's hard to tell where the relief is going to come from. Um, I know I was reading probably two, three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, that the Fed was looking at being fairly aggressive with their interest rate hikes this year. There was some talk that they might even start with a 50 50 basis point increase or a half of a percent increase in interest rates as soon as this month, March. Um, now that the Russia situation and the Ukraine situation is playing out the way that it's playing out, uh, there, there's a lot more uncertainty. And so the Fed is looking at, I think probably, at least the way it sounds more recently, they're looking at taking a more cautious approach, right? Because they don't want to crush the economy by blasting interest rates up super high, super quick. Uh, but we've talked in the past and it's worth repeating. There are several contributing factors that go into why the inflation rates are where they are. Uh, one of those is monetary policy, which comes from the Federal Reserve. And there are two components of that that are really worth knowing about. Number one, how much money is in the economy? Like how much cash are they actually putting into the economy? And then number two, where are they setting 
the base interest rate upon which all the other interest rates are are normally uh, pegged in a sense. You know, it's like when when the Fed raises interest rates, you usually see a domino effect throughout the markets. So that's the Fed. Well, another contributing factor is government spending. And I saw an article where the House of Representatives uh, yesterday or the day before just passed a $1.5 trillion spending bill. And uh, that hasn't yet gone, my understanding is that hasn't yet gone to the Senate, but you know the, the amount of money being spent by the federal government right now is just hard to comprehend. I mean, it's, it's astronomical and the deficits that they're running are astronomical. But a lot of times government spending gets injected directly into the economy. And um, so that's a way that keeps upward pressure on prices. And then another relevant fact for the moment that's contributing to inflation is the supply chain uh, issues. So when there are kinks in the market that are causing um, issues with the supply chain, you see upward pressure on prices because the demand for products is outpacing the supply of those products getting to the market. And so when I ask, where's the relief going to come from? Um, I'm looking at things and I'm like, okay, well, the, the war between Russia and Ukraine is causing more supply chain issues in energy and food at the very least, possibly a good bit more than that. I know that there are some rare earth minerals and such that go into like microchips that, that are being impacted. Nickel being one of them. Well, yeah. So, I mean, that's downstream from the automotive industry. Yeah. Nickel is usually something that goes into batteries. You know, I mean, it just, the, the impact reverberates through the economy. So I don't, I don't see a lot of relief coming from uh, from that part, I, I honestly don't see government spending being significantly restrained anytime soon. And, you know, now that the Fed is being a little more dovish with their interest rate uh, hiking plans, you know, it, it remains to be seen just how much they're going to ease off of their easy money policies that they've had in place now for some time. So if, if we're not seeing significant changes from any of those contributing sectors, uh, that indicates to me that inflation is going to be here for a while. So uh, like Psyche, you know, you were saying it, it's good to get prepared for that and uh, maybe be be prepared for it to be around for a while. Prices are probably going to keep going up for some time. Yeah, I agree. I suspect that I wouldn't be surprised if we were in this period through the end of this year. Um, I've, I've talked to, so myself personally, I'm in the market for a new zero turn lawnmower. And just like you spoke, shortages. There's, there's not, I mean, you could go to a big box store up until last year, apparently, and you'd see 50 of them outside Well, there's not 50 of them outside anymore. <laughs> and I, I talked to a client today uh, about, you know, a, a real estate client I was dealing with, and they were dealing with uh, some companies about putting a cover, you know, covered back patio, and they're six months out. And uh, my client said the reason for that is they can't get the supplies and they don't have as many crews. And he said, it doesn't matter. Even if he could get the supplies, he wouldn't have the crew, the manpower to get to you faster than six months. And if he had the manpower, he wouldn't have the supply. So he's got to have both. So right. that's two big issues for most American businesses right now is not only supplies, but the workforce and they have got to kind of solve themselves together, right. In order for the, the, the problem to be solved. Yeah. Well, it's going to be continuing continually harder and harder to get that labor into the market because, you know, there are 
something like 11 million unfilled jobs in the economy yep. right now. Yep. And wages aren't, evidently, they're not going up fast enough to fill those positions or those, you know, positions would be, you know, filled. The, the labor participation rate is still relatively low compared to historical standards, which means the number of working age people who are choosing to try to get a job or to have a job is relatively lower than historical standards. So you might, you might say that there's a lot of human capital in the economy that's sitting on the sidelines. And what is it going to take to get those people uh, back in the job market? And, yeah. and as long as that continues to be the case, there's going to be a lot of upward pressure on wages. And that's, that's the other part of the, the wage price spiral, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of bake inflation into the cake when you start seeing wages skyrocketing with prices. So yeah, that's exactly right. You know, well, let, let me pose a question out there before we moved on. Um, I've got an interesting question and that I'd like to pose to our audience out there and to our community of listeners and our followers. And I'd love to hear some feedback. You know, go to our Facebook, hit us up on TikTok, Rumble, YouTube, wherever. I want to get as much face back as uh, face back. <laughs> Maybe that's the latest social media platform. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to start face back. Yeah, that's <laughs> maybe we'll change our name. But I'd love to get as much feedback as possible because I don't have an answer to this question yet, but it's something I've been thinking about the past week ever since this Russia situation has developed, and it intrigues me. And, and I can't be the only one thinking this way, but I'd like to know what our listeners think when they read a story to the effect that let's take Visa or MasterCard, for example, and Visa and MasterCard has decided to shut down all services and transactions in, their, in, the, in, in Russia. And that means you, you can't buy you know, online, in person, anywhere. You can't use your Visa or MasterCard debit card or credit card and, and use your funds if it's a debit card. It's your money. Let's, let's clear that up. Now, I don't want to get into the debate of should we sanction Russia or not? That's not what this question's about. What this question is about is I want to know how our listeners feel about a private company shutting off access to their money or any other services that are rightfully belong to the consumer. Cause that kind of scares me a little bit from one angle. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, um, given that our neighbors to the North had a similar situation where they uh, recently invoked emergency powers that allowed the government to put freezes on on certain people's bank accounts and things of that nature uh, it definitely kind of makes you ask some questions about just how much power other people have over you and and whether or not that's a good thing uh, there's certainly cost of convenience that yeah. that a lot of people don't usually think about uh, but I do want to move on, given the timing here, and and look at our our next story. Uh, there's there's a a word that's starting to creep back into the lexicon uh, that that hasn't reared its ugly head in a while, but things are certainly starting to look that way, and that's stagflation. And what stagflation is is when you have high rates of inflation and either extremely low or negative economic growth. And we were just recently uh, mentioning that the rate of inflation is accelerating. Well, the, the information that seems to be coming out about the US economy is indicating that growth is decelerating. And I think at the end of last year, uh, quarter four, 2021, uh, growth was very strong and, and it was expected to be. I mean, once 
a lot of the COVID restrictions got lifted, the economy had every opportunity to start, you know, getting primed and, and rearing up again. And uh, we're seeing a lot of that slow down quite a bit. In fact, I read a story that indicated that some of the, the leading markers from the Atlanta Fed are showing that economic growth is trending down towards zero. Um, and I read an article on Fox, uh, Fox Business. Um, this was Jessica Chasmar at, at Fox Business that one of the experts they had on their, on their channel recently, uh, Dan Geltrude, he was suggesting that the US may already be in a recession. A lot of times you feel the recession before the data indicates that a recession has happened. The data is always a trailing indicator. Um, that's, that's pretty scary. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, it's kind of a given that that's gonna happen at some point in the near future. Um, our economy, you know, we're at record levels of inflation. We have 11 million job openings and employers can only pay so much in a given period of time. And in a lot of cases, you've seen where they've increased their salaries tremendously here in the past 12 to 18, well, we'll just say 12 months. And at some point, that growth of an economic cycle, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run out. So we, our growth is going to decelerate. I expect to see, actually, I, I do expect to see some stagnation. I really do. I think you're going to see the commodities market go up a little bit. That's kind of lagged the other markets. Uh, I, I, and I, I do expect at some point this year to kind of be in a stagnation period. Well, so let's dig into what to do about that. So first things first, if, if you're the average American, you're probably living pretty close to paycheck to paycheck. And the purchasing power of your money has gone down probably something like at least one to 2% in real terms, if not more over the last year. So that's kind of like taking a pay cut. Yep. So if you're that family and, and you're just hanging on paycheck to paycheck and, and you hear about this, what's a good plan of action? What do you do to uh, try to prepare for this, this coming storm? Okay. Well, the first thing you can do is make more money, right? That's the first thing. Go to your employer or wherever it is you work, start there, ask them for a raise especially if you haven't gotten one. If you haven't gotten a raise in the past six to 12 months, you need a raise. So if you're a good employee, your employer will give you a raise. That's one area. That's the first area that I would start at. The second one is what we talked about earlier. We kind of referenced a stockpile emergency savings account, you know, your Murphy's Law account. Um, right. You want to have as much of a cushion as possible. And the third thing is, and there's more than three, but the three top is that cushion also applies to your debt to income ratio. Get rid of as much debt as possible. So once you make more money and you have your cushion set aside and then you get rid of as much debt as possible, then you're not going to be affected as much. You, you can absorb the paying more for groceries and the paying more for gas because you've prepared for it with those three items. Now, it may delay some of your goals a little bit. You may not purchase that second home you wanted or that other vehicle you wanted or send your kids to this private school. They'll make, there may be certain things you have to delay in this type of period, but they're going to be necessary to get you through stronger on the other side. Sure. Well, what if you happen to be someone who does have some resources available? Uh, and, and you see this happening, maybe you've got some money that you could invest or you have invested. Uh, what's, what's your play on that side? 
what what looks good to you in this kind of a market so if you're talking on on wall street you know very volatile right now up and down you still take your customary percentage of your investable income put it in there i still recommend etfs i'm not big on individual stocks especially right now um it's just it's it's your stock picking at that point and you're trying to find values so i believe in, i'm a big fan of dollar cost averaging if you've got just to throw a number out there ten thousand dollars to put in well i don't recommend putting in ten thousand dollars on one day you know spread that out two thousand let's just say twenty five hundred dollars a week for four weeks or something like that dollar cost average that out because the market's going up and down in the long run you'll be better off if you translate that over to the real estate side i actually expect and i could be wrong here but i expect people to be able to find deals on the real estate side i really do what i'm noticing right now and this may be because of the time period we're coming out of winter and it's not summer yet we've gotten into spring the rest of the country really hasn't gotten a spring break yet that may have a factor in but i've seen some i've seen a good amount of properties sitting on the market longer and uh you've got to look real hard but they're there and i i have a sneaky suspicion that over the next six months you'll be able to score some deals that'll be interesting to see um I, I'm still a little concerned about what's going to happen on the real estate side because uh, our church, for example, we're, we were looking at trying to get into some new construction. And not only is it extremely expensive right now, but when I was talking to one of the, the local general contractors, they had said to me that some of their materials are 12 yeah. to 18 months out, you know, which just reinforces the point that you made earlier. Well, if, if materials are that scarce right now, that means that you can't expect a lot of new supply to flood the real estate market. And as long as, you know, demand is strong and supply is low, I think you're going to see a lot of upward pressure on those prices. The question is what's going to happen on the demand side. I mean, if, if interest rates are going up and economic performance is going down, you, you, do, you very well could see demand relax a little bit. Uh, maybe that's, maybe what you're seeing is a leading indicator of that process kind of settling in. So it definitely will be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, I, I think when it comes to the, the stock side, looking at at companies that have weathered storms in the past is is good look at look at people who have long track records uh, look at companies that have a strong record of paying dividends regardless of economic conditions uh, companies that have done well historically in tough times have a better chance of doing well now as times get tougher uh, you you probably want to avoid the kinds of investments that are, you know, real sensitive and volatile kinds, you know, because you might find that you're buying really high and and selling really low, which is exactly what you don't want to do. Yeah. So anyway, well, I think it's a good time to to look at our last story today uh, from from the current events during the last episode. You mentioned, well, hey, you know, it might not be a bad idea to look at an electric vehicle if that's in your budget. And of course, we've heard from some of the the government officials this week that, hey, you know, higher gas prices, maybe that'll help us transition to a more electric economy. So I I wanted to find out, does that actually make sense? So here's a, a couple of quick pros and cons, and I'll throw those out there, and then I'd like your feedback, Psyche. Um, when you look at the cost of actually uh, filling up, so to speak, you, you fill up your batteries with electrical charge or you fill up your internal combustion engine gas tank with gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you look at a, 
a Tesla Model 3 versus a uh, Honda Accord, apples to apples, both 2020 model years. Um, and this is an article from Forbes magazine written by Brooke Crothers. It looks like the annual fuel costs for a Tesla Model 3 long range are about $500 a year. And that's based on, I wanna say a thousand miles a month of use and 20 kilowatt hour, uh, 20 cent per kilowatt hour electricity costs. So obviously electricity is more expensive now than that, but then, you know, gasoline is more expensive too. So um, annual fuel costs at the time, about $500 for the Tesla, $1,050 for the Honda Accord sedan. So, you know, that's going to depend now on, on where the electricity rates are versus where the gasoline costs are. But theoretically, uh, it looks like a compelling argument that electricity is cheaper than gas in terms of the use. Um, so that's definitely a pro on the EV side. A con on the EV side is that those vehicles are not inexpensive. And so you have a, a very high upfront cost to get into an EV. If you're financing that, that's going to translate to a higher monthly payment, which is potentially going to more than offset the costs of uh, the savings that you would realize from the electricity. Um, another thing to, to factor in is that most homes do not come um, <laughs> with the sorts of charging equipment that's needed for these these vehicles. So that would have to be an aftermarket addition in most homes. And the costs of that are going to be somewhere around about a thousand dollars as well. So you've got you've got some high barriers to entry, but once you have one, it looks like the the cost from a month to month basis and a year to year basis goes down. So what are your thoughts? now that I've thrown all that out there in terms of, does it make sense or not? You know, I think a lot of it is going to be based on where you live and what type of infrastructure you have to accommodate your lifestyle. And let me clarify that. We really don't have the charging infrastructure in this country that we need for EVs yet. They, they are popping up at record pace and you are seeing more and more of them. The biggest hindrance to me in the way my lifestyle is, is you're limited with an EV to how long you can go. And right. you'll have to pull over for even what's a quick charge, 45 minutes. And you pull over for a quick charge at 45 minutes, as opposed to filling up your tank for five minutes and, and being back on the road again. So that's really the biggest hindrance to me. Now, having said that, well, and that's what keeps me from getting one because of my travel style and, and how I am. But having said that, if you're somebody that doesn't travel like that and you're not on the road a lot and you're, you're home to work, home to work, and you're within 100 miles or so, um, if you can absorb the upfront cost and you're in it for the long haul, I don't think it's a bad idea. You, it's, it's more predictable. You can you can budget that a little easier, I think, than you can gas, especially the last four or five years with the fuel prices, the way they've been. The way, you know, electricity is, is a lot of these electricity companies or utility companies, they buy their energy rates on a contract that are typically two to three years in length. So they're locked into a certain rate. They will go up. Uh, micro mentally, I guess, really small, but they don't usually go up like you see gas prices go up. So right. you can predict that a little bit better. And I like that. And uh, I mean, really, electricity is still cleaner for the environment, even though it may not be produced 
in the best way, still cleaner for the environment than that fuel is. Well, I, I think you hit on something that's that's important there. The transition to a more electrified economy is going to take a good bit of time. I don't think this is something that just happens when a lot more people go down to their local Tesla dealership because electricity is still predominantly produced with fossil fuels in this country. So even if you're not putting gasoline into an internal combustion engine, someone somewhere is burning some fossil yeah. fuel to make the electricity that is recharging your batteries. So the long-term solution is eventually going to be to find a way to get off of fossil fuels on the production side. And that's a conversation that's worth delving into uh, on a future episode. But before we, we transition to the savings hack, I wanted to present an alternative that is probably a lot more attainable for folks. Let's say that you drive an older model truck or an SUV there's a pretty good chance that your gas mileage is somewhere in the 15 to 18 miles per gallon range. I know, for example, I was uh, recently an owner of a 2005 F-150 pickup truck, and I was getting about 14.7 miles per gallon in that truck. But if you go from 15 to 22 miles per gallon, which basically means either getting a newer model vehicle or if you can't afford a newer model vehicle going from a, an older truck to an older sedan and you can get something that gets 22 or 23 miles a gallon that's a 50 percent increase in fuel mileage which means a 50 percent decrease in your fuel costs so if you're spending 500 dollars a month on gas which i know is a lot but just for numbers sake, if you go from a truck to a car, you're going to see a decrease of 50% uh, in, in your costs. You're saving almost 170 bucks a month by doing that. That's a big deal. Um, obviously, you could save a lot more going from an old pickup truck to a brand new Tesla but most folks can't afford to do that. One thing you can do though, is look to, uh, to get into something that's more fuel efficient. Uh, if you're already in something that gets 25 or 30 miles a gallon, that's not gonna give as big a savings for you on the margin. But if you're in something that, that is not getting good mileage in terms of say 20 miles a gallon or less, you really have an opportunity to save a lot of money by moving into something that's more fuel efficient. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, at, at this time in the show, it's, it's time for me to pass off to you so that you can tell everyone about the savings <laughs> hack of the week. So the savings hack this week is something that is right on key. And uh, I guess I should say right on cue with what we're discussing here today. It's, pay yourself first and make it automatic. And it sounds real simple, right? <laughs> but there is still a way too small percentage of people in this world that do not adhere to that. And let me clarify what that means. So it doesn't matter if you work for yourself, you work for somebody else, if you have a W2, W4, 1099, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, when you get paid, when you receive money, I want everybody to pay themselves first. I want them to take some of that money. It could be 1% to start with. It could be 2%. It could be 10%, whatever you want. And automatically transfer it to a separate savings account. Do not keep it in the same account as your operating slash checking account. And if that's the only thing you do for the next couple months in terms of financial goals that will be most you know more than most people and it just we have we have this internal mental issue with we never think we have enough money to spend 
and we don't think we have as much money as we need to cover our bills. Well, it's so interesting what happens when you take that money out first, let's just say you make $30,000 a year and you're clearing somewhere around $500 a year and you're going to take 5% of that a week. What's that, $25 a week? I think, quick math, something like that. Um, is that right? I think so. I think you're right. <laughs> I can't think to do math and talk at the same time. But let's say you only take a few percent, it's $25 a week. You take that and you set it up automatically to transfer to savings account. Well, after 52 weeks, one year, you're going to have what? Almost $1,100 or something like that. And, and leave it there for an emergency rainy day, your fund, or use that to build up your investment side. But that's the savings hack of the week. You won't get ahead unless you do it intentionally. And pay yourself first, then move on to your other obligations, and you'll be better off for it. Uh, it's a little thing that I thought of there is that most employers will actually set their direct deposit up to put that money in the other account automatically for you, like a payroll yes. deduction. Yes. So, you know, if, if you can do that, I mean, think about this. There's a reason why the federal government wants to withhold the taxes from your paycheck, right? Because yeah. they don't want you to write that check in April when you submit your tax return exactly. and write a big old fat check to them. Yeah. You know, they just want you to never even think about it. Well, the same thing works for yourself. You know, you take that 25 bucks and have it automatically deposited in, into another account. You know, look at it, don't think about it uh, the way you do your operating account. And, um, you know, it just, it, it's a good habit, a good discipline to be in. And you, after a while, you won't miss it. You won't even think about it. You're not even going to know it's gone. You're going to train yourself to get used to living on the money without that amount. Right. And, and a funny thing happens, six months down the line, 12 months down the line, you're going to go, oh, huh, I've been doing $25. I can probably do $30. I can probably do $35. And then it becomes a challenge to see how much you can save, but still have the quality of life you want. And, and here's a bonus one. When you get a raise, include that in, in your paying yourself first and increase it by that, Absolutely. apply that percentage to the raise. Absolutely, good advice. Well, with that, I think that it's time to, to wrap up this episode. So do you have any final thoughts before we uh, sign off? No, I just want everybody to stay safe out there. Interesting times, stay safe, stay healthy and follow us on our social media sites. Yeah, come back and see us. Subscribe. You'll you'll automatically get everything we put out. So, uh, well, we'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, uh, we would like you to join us at our Locals page. You can do that at the purposefulpodcast.locals.com. You can find us on Facebook by looking up Convergent Digital Media. You can find our audio podcasts on your favorite podcast directory. And if you do that, please subscribe. If you're watching us on YouTube or Rumble, please subscribe there. And uh, our, our content will automatically populate your feed. We'd like uh, any feedback that you have. You can send us questions or comments by email. And you can do that at the purposeful podcast at convergentdigitalmedia.com. So uh, I think we've definitely covered our basis for this week. We hope that you hang in there and come back and see us again next week. Thanks for listening to the Purposeful Podcast with Matt Fiebig and Psyche Filios. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to join us on Locals at thepurposefulpodcast.locals.com. And find us on YouTube and Rumble by searching for The Purposeful Podcast. If you like this podcast, don't forget to rate and review. This has been a production of Convergent Digital Media. Visit ConvergentDigitalMedia.com for more info. Thanks again for listening to The Purposeful Podcast.